Uh, as Eric said, my name is Aaron Gustafson. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, and yes, I do work at, at Microsoft now as a standards and accessibility advocate. Um, and I just want to start by saying thank you very much to Eric and Jeffrey for having me back continuously. Um, it's been my greatest pleasure in this industry to, to be able to come back and speak at AEA. And to Toby and Marcy and Mike and everybody who makes this show run awesome, thank you all so much. Um, all right, so let's kick it off and talk a little bit about PWA stuff. So some of you in the audience may be wondering what the heck is a PWA? Like we just, we swim in acronym soup, right? Um, so apart from being another acronym, this actually stands for Progressive Web App. Um, now what the heck is that, <laughs> right? Um, you're not alone in wondering this. There are a lot of really smart people out there who've been kind of questioning what exactly is this progressive web app thing and what does it mean, even the person who helped to coin the term. Um, so um, when it comes down to it, uh, and this is, is something that Francis Berryman, who actually did coin the term, um, said, is that progressive web app is really a marketing term. So for those of you who've been on the web for a little while, if you remember back when uh, when Apple unveiled their HTML5 showcase that was all CSS3 stuff, and you were like, HTML5? No. Um, it's the same sort of thing, or those of you who are really old and remember uh, DHTML. Yeah, same, same thing, right? It's a marketing term. This is not necessarily for us as developers, but it's a way for us to have kind of a shared conversation about what the future of the web uh, looks like. Um, so I think one of the things about the term progressive web app that trips a lot of people uh, up is this focus on web app. Like what exactly is a web app anyway? Uh, Jeremy Keith's a great person to, uh, to follow to get some input into that particular thing. I won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I think what it's important to realize is that um, a progressive web app can really be any kind of project that you are building on the web. It doesn't have to be something that you would consider an app in big giant air quotes. Um, and in reality, a progressive web app is really just a progressive website, right? You can think of it that way. Like the web app thing is a little bit of a distraction. So um, a lot of folks who have heard about progressive web apps are like, oh yeah, that's a Google thing, right? Um, and that happened a lot because Alex Russell, who is uh, the other half of Francis Berryman, um, uh, works at Google, and so everybody thought, okay, this is a Google thing. But the reality is that every major browser, to some extent, is supporting the technologies that underpin progressive web apps at this point, and most of us are actively engaged in the evolution of the various specs that, that kind of go into creating progressive web apps. Um, you know, some, some notable exceptions in, in PWA's uh, support is like iOS, Safari doesn't support push notifications yet. But honestly, that's kind of a minor thing. Apple will probably name it something else later on when they unveil it and everybody will be like, ooh, this is a really cool thing that Apple came up with, but that's beside. Um, so, but for a lot of us in the room who are technologists, what is a PWA from like a technical standpoint? What does this mean to us? What do we need to do in order to turn something into a progressive web app? Well, it starts with having a site that is secure. You have to have an SSL certificate. You have to be running HTTPS. This is a, a quintessential part of creating a, a progressive web app. Um, the next thing that you'll need is something called a web app manifest. Now, what the heck is that? So a web app manifest is basically a big JSON file um, that has meta information about your site. So if, if you've ever done any modifications to your site to add like the Apple touch icon, meta tags, and like all this other stuff, all of that can be subsumed within the web app manifest. So you can have different icon sizes, um, you can define what your start URL is, like your preferred orientation if you have one, um, colors and, and things like that, so you can actually style like the, the Chrome of the browser around your PWA. Um, this is where all of that meta app related information, uh, presentation related information goes. And uh, I'm not gonna do a super deep dive into to Web App Manifest, but it's, it's a fairly easy key value pair sort of setup. 
And then the third piece is what's called service workers, uh, the service worker spec. And I'm gonna pause on that for a moment, put a pin in service worker, and kind of talk about PWAs in general and why they're something you might wanna consider if you haven't considered them yet. Um, so a lot of people wonder, you know, should we believe the hype around PWAs? Because there is a lot of hype around PWAs. Um, I, have a, I have an alert that I get every morning in my RSS feed that is just all of the, the PWA announcements that are, are going out, and there's quite a lot. Um, and there are companies who've had some real success with PWAs, so I would say maybe. I'm not a, I'm not a big bandwagon jumper, but I feel like PWAs actually have some, uh, some value that's worth recognizing. So Starbucks, for instance, saw a two-time increase in daily active users. If you do use the Starbucks uh, website at all and you are a, a member, like you log into it to, to use like your, your card or something like that, um, you are using the PWA. Um, interestingly, they also have really high PWA usage numbers on desktop. Um, I think it was something, last, last time I talked to them, it was something like 40% of their PWA order aheads came from desktop. And we, we often think about PWAs as being this mobile thing, um, but they're actually seeing really high desktop usage. Tinder was able to take their core experience of their native app from 30 megs down to 2.8 megs for the PWA. That is insane. <laughs> like, that is a tremendous amount of savings in terms of size. And this is really important to people who are on um, limited devices, devices that may not have a whole lot of storage space in them, um, and who honestly may not want to devote a whole lot of their bandwidth to downloading your experience. Uh, Trivago saw an increase in uh, people clicking out to their hotel offers. Uh, West Elm saw an increase in time on site and an increase in revenue for their PWA. Um, there are a ton of these success stories out there. Uh, Jason Grigsby from Cloud4 uh, and his team compiled T PWA stats, um, and you can either follow them on Twitter or they have a, a beautiful site that points to all of the white papers and articles and success stories for progressive web apps. And if you have success with PWAs, you should definitely let them know too so you can spread the word. So I recommend checking that out. But back to kind of our minimum viable PWA, MV PWA. Maybe, I don't know. Um, so I mentioned service worker, and I wanna tuck into what exactly that is. Um, so a service worker is a special kind of web worker, and if you're familiar with what web workers are, or if you're not, they basically run in a separate thread from the main JavaScript that's taking place in your page. So it doesn't block the user experience, it doesn't cause, lay or cause uh, like refreshes or, or janky scrolling or anything like that because it runs separately. And service workers are wholly concerned with network independence, basically, at this point. Like, there's some other features that they have, but that's the, the main one. And I often think of it as kind of my own personal man in the middle, if you're familiar with the idea of a man in the middle attack, someone who sits between you and the, the network or the, the content that you're trying to get and can manipulate that. Um, you register a service worker by first testing to see whether the browser supports service worker, and then if it does, you can go ahead and register that service worker, and then it's, it's very similar to how a web worker works. And the path is actually super important. You want your service worker file to exist in the root folder that you want it to act upon. So if you were to tuck this into your JavaScript folder, it would only be able to intercept network requests within that JavaScript folder. So in most cases, you want it in the root of your site, or if you've got a subdirectory for your, your app, or you've got a different host name or something like that. Like you want it in as close to the root as possible for what you want to control. So in terms of um, how this ends up working, so there, there's this whole life cycle to a service worker, and I'm not going to get too deep into this. I'm going to kind of do the Cliff's Notes version. Um, but when a browser encounters a page that registers a service worker, um, it goes ahead and uh, kicks off the install process. So you can use this, there's an event for this, you can use this as an opportunity to uh, pre-cache some assets um, and, and do other things like that. Once that happens, it goes through what's called an activated event, um, and that's a good time when, when you might wanna clean up old cached stuff. So if you've, let's say, replaced your logo or something like that, you might wanna kill that old cache entirely. And, and load in new assets. 
Um, and then it's ready to run, but it doesn't actually do anything until the next page is loaded. So that's a kind of a crucial thing too, so you don't get it. Like often we hear this term offline first, which really means we should be thinking about offline first, but it doesn't mean that offline can actually happen first because you need to be online before you can be offline. Does that make sense? Like you have to download something, right? Um, so once, once you've gone through the activation process with the service worker, it's ready. Um, and so either a browser refresh or moving to another page, um, or there is there is an ability uh, within service worker to basically take over the existing page as well, but it's not the default setup. Um, and then your service worker is in play. So in a traditional networking space, we would have the browser making requests to the internet and the internet replying, hopefully, with those with those assets that you're requesting or the pages that you're requesting, right? Now, with our service worker coming in and acting as a man in the middle, it can actually intercept those and it has access to a cache within the browser. So when you make a request, the service worker could say, okay, let me see if I've got that page that you're looking for or that asset that you're looking for already cached and just respond with that so it never touches the network at all. This is how you're actually able to create really nice offline experiences, um, especially if you're, if you're dealing mainly with content-driven sites. Um, or there might be a scenario where you request it, but nope, not in the cache. So we'll go ahead and we'll request it from the web, and then we'll go ahead and tuck a copy into the cache and respond with the resource that we received. Okay. And caching is really key to improving performance and providing a good offline experience, which are kind of the hallmark of progressive web apps. Now, when we step back for a moment, though, and, and don't just focus on kind of those three technical pieces of a PWA, what we're really talking about is building experiences that are good experiences. So PWAs really do require us to start with a great web experience and enhance that experience for performance, for resilience. You can install these, um, and they have higher engagement as well, typically. And the key word there is enhance. And what are we enhancing? We're enhancing a great web experience. Um, now, if you combine that word enhance with the first word in progressive web apps, which is progressive, you get progressive enhancement, which is what the core idea behind PWAs is, is that we're starting with something that works universally, and we're improving that experience with all of these new things like Service Worker and, and with making it installable via the, the Web App Manifest and stuff. So we're gonna start with a great web experience. And how do we do that? Okay. Um, first of all, hallmarks of a great web experience, not just of a PWA, are that they should be available universally. Right? No matter what the network is, no matter what the device is that's being used to access them, no matter what the, the browsing context is. Um, and they should be universally accessible as well. So there shouldn't be any barriers to anyone being able to access the content or to be able to, to accomplish key tasks within the interface. Um, so yeah, the first, first word is progressive and with good reason. And I wanna tuck into that a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, progressive means happening or developing gradually or in stages, step by step, and we're gonna tuck into exactly what that means with building great web experiences. Starting by focusing on what matters within your, your site or your application. So I love this screenshot of Forbes from 2007 because the bit that is not darkened out is the stuff that somebody came to that page to learn about. This page is not focused at all. They've since had many subsequent redesigns, but this one just kind of blows my mind. <laughs> like, um, we need to focus on what it is that, that somebody is coming to our pages to do, what the key tasks are that they need to accomplish, um, whether it's content that they wanna read, whether it's they need to check into their bank account or, or check their bank balance, or they need to you know, see what's happening on social media. We need to help them to accomplish that as quickly as possible. That's the whole point of our job as designers, um, is to design great experiences. Um, and this actually dovetails really nicely with Luke Robluski's mobile-first idea 
um, because it got us thinking about small screens and, and having to be very focused because we didn't have the screen real estate. But the reality is that mobile first isn't just about mobile, really. It's talking about like being focused and, and being able to provide a nice focused experience regardless of where that is being rendered in terms of context. It could be you know, a side-by-side -side app or it could be a small window that you're, you're using on your, your desktop machine just as easily as it could be something on a mobile device. So we need to focus, like, why is our user here? What tasks do they need to accomplish? Is there anything on the screen that's distracting them from being able to, to do what it is that they came here to do? We need to remember that text is the first interface. The way that our content is experienced by people who rely on assistive technology like screen readers, like if it doesn't work for them, it really isn't working for anybody. There's a lot that, that ends up going unsaid and that gets lost in translation from design. We expect design to do all this heavy lifting for us to explain an interface to somebody when we should be doing creating an interface that's clear to folks just from the text that's in the page. And this becomes even more important as we move into the, the future of headless UIs where we're interacting with people via smart speakers and in our car and stuff like that. Um, so when we think about text, we have to think, is the copy written clearly? Does it use language that our users will easily understand? Are we talking to them like they talk to each other, right? Is the copywriting voice appropriate to our organization? And does the, the copy strike the right tone? Um, so we often lose sight of it, but language influences how people use and think about our products. And it can create friction in the user journey, um, or it can foster delight. And how we talk to our users matters because it makes them care or not about what it is that we're doing. So, this is often something that developers struggle with. Um, and if you're, if you're a developer and you struggle with content and, and copywriting and such, I highly recommend Voice and Tone, uh, which is a resource from MailChimp. And then uh, Nicely Said, which is a fantastic book uh, from Nicole Fenton and Kate Kiefer Lee. Uh, those are two fantastic resources for kind of boning up on what it means to think about uh, content that we write and content as an interface. Um, it's also worth noting that for some people, that will be the only experience they have. A uh, little anecdote, my first experience on the web was via a text-based browser, and I could not use any of the websites that I was trying to access. I was, I was forced to access the web on Gopher because we didn't have the ability to connect a visual browser to our school's computer to get out on the, the net, and so Sony.com just said image, 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 and I said, this web thing is bullshit. <laughs> Like, I had no interest at that point. Who knew, who knew that this would be my career after that? But um, yeah, I mean, we have, to, we have to think about what that experience is. Um, and then we also have to, to look around and ask, like, is there anything that we could do that would help our users be more successful um, more easily? What can we do in terms of helper text, in terms of uh, potentially placeholders, but please don't abuse placeholders? Um, you know, what sort of, of things can we do? What sort of affordances can we create to help users be successful? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? So once we focus on what matters, we need to actually think about what the markup is that we're using and how we're using that markup to support that core experience of text, okay? Um, the words that we choose absolutely matter, but so does the content that we wrap it in, or the, the markup we use uh, to wrap it in. So here is a bunch of, of content that would be similar to what you would see on a blog, right? sample blog post. Um, it's all marked up in divs. Right? So how could we step through this and improve it? Well, first of all, we have a bit of self-contained content that is the blog post. Right? Div with a class of entry. There's an element for that. If something is self-contained content that can stand on its own, it is an article. And don't think of article as in article in a magazine, because that's not always the case. Think of article as an article of clothing, something that, that can be uh, autonomous. Moving down, here we have a div with a class of entry title uh, for the title for the blog post. Of course, there's markup for that. H1s through H6s are what we should be using for those. Talking about which one you should use is a whole other topic I will not get into today. There are holy wars started over that. Um, here we have a, a div with a class of entry meta. So this is meta information, the, the date it was published, how long it'll take to read, that sort of stuff. Um, there's actually a really great 
uh, construct for key value pairs like this, it's the description list. Um, so you have this DL and then you have DTs for description terms and DD for description data. Um, so this is an awesome little construct we used to only use for glossaries, but it's super useful in other places as well. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out. Um, a little bonus, you can wrap that date in a time element so that it's actually recognizable as being time. Um, we can even declare machine readable times within that too um, in order to make it even more available to, uh, to machines that might want to consume this and, and do something interesting with it. Moving down into the content, man, this used to be my life back in like 2000, lots and lots of BRs between things or better yet, two paragraph tags in between, like two unclosed paragraph tags in between, just text. Um, yeah, in, in like 37 tables that were nested within each other, but. Um, we could wrap those, like basically all you're trying to do with those BRs is trying to get blocks, right? You're trying to get lines between them. Um, I'm kind of surprised this didn't, wasn't marked up in divs, right? Um, but that doesn't have any meaning apart from this is just a division, a generic division of content uh, within this. We can supply meaning using meaningful elements like P, which is for paragraphs. And this can be really useful uh, to voice assistants and such, which can pause between paragraphs to give people's ears a break for a moment as opposed to running it all together. Um, so I'm sure some of you in the audience at least are probably wondering like, why should I care with CSS? I can make this all look the same, right? But the reality is it doesn't look the same. If you were to turn off all styles and go with the default style sheet, so something, something happens in the network and your CSS does not arrive and does not apply to your page, this is what you would end up with with your div soup, okay? Whereas if you actually applied some semantic markup and got default styles, hey, that's actually super readable, right? Even in the worst situation, you still have something that is usable by your, your users. That's a robust website right there. And we should be aiming to do that. Um, poor semantics and exclusionary design like this, it, it's, it's an, or rather, poor semantics is an exclusionary design choice that we make uh, that causes a mismatch between what we as cited folks experience and what people who rely on assistive technology experience because most assistive technology can't infer any meaning from design, okay? We create accessibility issues, right? We're the designers, and if we build only for other people like us, we actively exclude anyone who's not like us. I love this chart. This is from the inclusive design um, handbook from, uh, from Microsoft. There's a lot of really great uh, material in there. And if we use good semantics, um, it helps us build that consideration for people who are not like us from the very beginning because we're conveying meaning in multiple ways, okay, both visually, non-visually, et cetera. And because we're relying on standards, things that exist uh, out there that we all can take advantage of because they're part of the HTML spec, um, they, that means they can be used by a broader audience. And the burden of providing the correct accessibility mappings and such is on the browser rather than each of us as individual developers. Um, and then interactive, uh, or interaction rather, with different input types and stuff like that actually comes along for free as well, which is a, an added bonus. We don't have to work as hard if we can take advantage of what the browser has built into it. So we absolutely should do that. And we can also do more with semantic markup. So if, if you were to ask a smart speaker in the, in the future, once they become a little bit more web aware, you know, hey, Cortana, read me the top three headlines in today's New York Times, it could go to nytimes.com and find the first three article elements and pull the headings from those first three article elements. That's pretty powerful. Or it could even, if it wanted to be even smarter, look at all of the article elements and check their time value and see which were the latest three, no matter how they're laid out on the page. And that's pretty awesome. So don't worry about looking at this JavaScript, but I just wanna say like, here is using query selector all to find articles, to find article headings. So looking for H1s, twos, and threes, um, because the New York Times site has kind of a bunch of different heading levels in there. But like, 
it's not that complicated to build these sorts of crawlers to, to expose this information to people. Um, you can read more about meaningful semantics uh, for voice UX on, in uh, Alyssa Part in this article that I wrote. Um, and uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about dependencies because this is something that I, I think kind of goes hand in hand with this. Um, when we use good markup, we actually do reduce dependencies. I mentioned that, that we can take advantage of things that browsers give us for free, right? So I'm going to give you a, just a simple illustration of what I mean by this. So let's say you're trying to create a button on your site. There are a couple of different ways that you might mark that up. You might say input type equals submit. Or you might say button type equals submit. Or you might say anchor class button with an octothorpe in, in place of the href. Or if you're Google, you might say div class button. It's like every, every single uh, Gmail version has always been div buttons. I never understood it. But anyway, so there's four different ways that you could potentially make your button, right? And they may seem all to be pretty much equivalent because you can make them look the same, right? Um, but the reality is that they're not equal. So if you were to build an input with a type of submit or a button with a type of submit, it is displayed as a button by default, no style sheets applied. It has the semantic exposure of being a button, so assistive technology will recognize it as being a button. It is focusable via the tab key in the source order of the document. It is capable of being activated by mouse, by touch, by enter, and by space. And both of them can actually submit forms. Not the same for anchors and divs. So an anchor element is displayed as a link by default. So if your CSS fails, you end up with something that's a link that may not be immediately intuitive to your users is something that should submit your form. Um, in terms of accessibility, it's a named generic, so it doesn't really come across as anything special. It doesn't, it doesn't represent itself as a button. Um, you can focus it, so that's, that's a plus, I guess. Um, and it can be activated by mouse and touch and enter, but not space. And it does not submit forms. A div is just a generic block in terms of its representation. It's not exposed at all, especially in terms of accessibility. It is not focusable. You cannot activate it via anything because it's not interactive, and it doesn't submit forms. So what this means is that without anything added to it, our site will not work if we don't use either of those first two options, the input or the button. For the anchor and the div, we need to do a lot of extra work. Okay, so in order to accomplish uh, the same thing, in order to end up with the same potential end result, in the best case scenario, we need to write CSS to make it look like a button. In either of those cases, we need to add ARIA to both of those in order to expose them as a button. We need to add some additional HTML to a div in order to make it focusable by adding it to the tab index. We need to add JavaScript to make it uh, something that can be activatable uh, by mouse touch, um, and keyboard as appropriate, and we need to extra, add extra JavaScript to submit the form. Okay. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, ARIA is the Accessible Rich Internet Application spec, uh, which uses HTML attributes in order to, to be able to imbue um, additional accessibility information into an element. So you can say role equals button on the div or the anchor in order to expose it as a button. But in adding more dependencies, we create more potential for fragility in our sites. If our JavaScript fails to be downloaded or executed properly, maybe because somebody has a plugin that interferes with something it's doing, that can cause our site to no longer be usable. And if your site sells widgets and you can't help somebody check out with a widget, no matter what, you've failed, <laughs> right? No matter what happens, somebody should be able to buy that widget. So we should look for every opportunity to lower our dependencies. One strange one, this, this popped up a, a couple months ago. Michael Spellacy sent me this. Um, he, was, he was kind of throwing this out there for the doubters about progressive enhancement. So Chrome 66 shipped, and they, took, or they, they added a thing that basically threw out uh, SSL for 
these old semantic um, SSL certificates, which that server had been compromised or something like that. So they weren't trusting that SSL certificate anymore. And his employer, about 200 of their sites, had those certificates that expired. So if you don't know how it works, when you're on HTTPS, any assets that you're trying to load that are not served securely are not going to be downloaded because they're not secure. You end up with mixed content, if you've ever seen a mixed content warning. Okay, or, you'll, or a user will be prompted to whether they want to accept mixed content. Um, so their CDN um, no longer had a valid SSL certificate, so none of the CSS and JavaScript for over 200 sites was loaded. And this isn't isolated. Um, Sky, uh, which is a broadband provider in the UK, they blocked jQuery for the better part of a day, served from the jQuery CDN. Uh, so any site that relied on jQuery no longer worked. Um, I've gotten bad versions of, of JavaScript libraries from CDNs before, and uh, the JavaScript just fails to run. Gawker Media, RIP, they uh, launched their, their new platform back in 2013 that was all JavaScript-based uh, to render blogs, oddly. But, um, and there was a bug in their code when they flipped the switch, and none of their sites rendered any content, but they all had little spinning loading icons, even though nothing was ever loading. Like, this stuff happens, right? So the more, the more dependencies we add, the more fragility we, ca we create in our, in our interfaces. So instead, we should flip that around and think about, OK, how can we create an experience that works universally and then enhance that experience and, and, and improve it as we have better and better capabilities? So to give an example, here's a simple, super simple email field. Okay? Um, so the type email has a couple of experience deltas. First of all, does the uh, browser support the email type? Okay. Um, if it does support the email type, does it have a validation algorithm uh, that supports email and it can check that, that uh, the email is valid that somebody's put in here? And it can actually prompt them with an error. Um, if somebody's in a virtual keyboard context, maybe they end up getting this enhanced email keyboard that helps users enter uh, email more easily. The cool thing is, though, if email is not supported, this just falls back to being a standard text input because it's a progressive enhancement. And that's what we had for 15 years on the web before we had HTML5. Um, moving down to the required attribute, if the browser doesn't support validation, nothing happens. But we should still have validation on the server side and possibly even on the client side if we wanted to. Um, and then kind of moving down further, we've got the ARIA required. Um, again, ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. If ARIA does understand this attribute, it will let somebody who's using assistive technology know that this field is required as well. But it's uh, all an enhancement. And this is kind of dependent on two things. Does the browser expose the ARIA required property? And can the assistive tech being used actually consume that information? So you end up with a couple of different deltas as we're going along here. You've got this basic text input that works universally, and then you have required validation, then you have required notifications to the users that something isn't filled out that should be, and then you have email validation, and then finally, maybe a dedicated keyboard to entering that. So your users may fall anywhere along this spectrum, but they're always gonna have a usable experience, but they may have a more awesome experience, depending on, on what they can get, which is kinda cool. Um, and when you start to think about user experience as a continuum like this that scale, scales with capabilities, um, it's really elegant. And it, it creates something that's gonna be very robust and will continue to work for you, no matter what happens. All right, so moving on. Um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to think about how we're designing in support of the core experience. Um, so we've had a bunch of different design uh, methodologies over the years that we've been able to use. You can kind of think of them somewhat along a, a continuum. Um, and in fact, uh, Manuel Matosevich, um, who I was mentoring last year, put together this demo that actually demonstrates how these can be used to enhance layout. He started with a simple block layout, and then uh, as you move along, it moves to floats, and then you move along to flex, and then grid, um, which is kind of cool, and he just did it all with a, a slider, and it applies different uh, different styles. I think it actually only changes the body class and then the styles overwrite each other, which is, is kind of neat. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that works um, in a moment. So Jeff Veen said, I've, I've been amazed at how often those outside the discipline of design assume that what designers do is decoration, likely because so much bad design simply is decoration. Good design isn't. Good design is problem solving. Again, 
going back to the fact that we, whether you consider yourself a developer or a product owner or what have you, we're all designers. We're all designing the experience. We're all tasked with making our, our users' lives better, right? We're all tasked with solving problems on their behalf uh, to try and help them be successful in what they're coming to us to do. Um, so graphic design offers a bunch of different tools for illuminating content and for providing uh, meaning and structure. Um, I'm gonna focus on just a couple of these and give some, some quick example, uh, click examples. So alignment helps our eyes move more efficiently. Contrast draws our eyes to important bits of information and away from less important ones. Um, how we use elements and, and size them relative to one another can help a layout feel more natural. Uh, so for example, the golden ratio. Um, proximity helps us to group related content more easily. Um, and a consistent vertical rhythm can make, it, uh, make a layout feel more structured and it can really improve readability. Jeffrey's talked a little bit about that. Um, and then creating unity, visual unity using similar colors and such can make a, a interface feel much more cohesive. Um, now on the web, as opposed to kind of traditional print graphic design, we have a, a bunch of other considerations that we need to take into account. Um, because the web is not print, and it's not TV, and it's not all of these other things. Um, and so we've come up with ways to ad address quite a few of these. Um, for screen size and stuff, we have responsive layouts and responsive images and such. For resolution, we have SVGs, so the, our, our scalable vector graphics, and responsive images able to kind of deal with that. Um, we have the ability to tune contrast for brightness so that our sites still look good when your battery is down to 5% and you've turned down the brightness on your screen so you can limp along and you're outside and it's really hard to read the site. Like, that's why we need high contrast, right? Um, we have uh, color density, which we can address by um, providing color choices and using media queries. Uh, we've got things like dark and light mode detection now, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm gonna skip over user preference, but I'll circle back to it in a moment. Um, and then in dealing with network speed and quality, we have responsive images, system fonts, and of course, service worker too. Um, and I'll, I'll circle back and, and touch on uh, user preference as well as assistive technology. So um, examples of user preference would be things like larger and smaller fonts. Okay, if we use M's, for instance, for our media queries, there's this really neat thing that can happen that as we, um, let's say you have a, a tablet, right? As you increase the font size, you might be showing kind of more of a desktop -y layout in that tablet, but as you increase the font size, if you're using M's for your media queries, your layout can switch to the narrower view as the text gets bigger. So it becomes more and more like a mobile reader as the text gets bigger, which is kind of neat because it's all, all based on uh, font sizes as opposed to being based on pixel sizes. Um, in the, uh, the realm of Microsoft, we've had the ability to detect whether a user is in high contrast mode. Um, so there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk about like the dark mode thing that, that Apple unveiled and then uh, Google has implemented and such. Um, high contrast is another thing that we should be paying attention to. We are currently working on a spec to bring this to uh, CSS all up so that it's not just limited to, uh, to people in, in Edge and Windows. Um, but it's something that you can tailor the, uh, the site to do. Um, if you've seen me uh, on stage before, especially in like the last year or so, I talked a lot about the uh, 10K Apart site that we built, and we actually had a lot of high contrast styles in there for uh, black on white and white on black. Um, and then the prefers reduced motion, Val talked a little bit about that uh, as well, so that's another example of a user preference, and Sarah talked about that too. Um, in terms of assistive technologies, there's a variety of things that we should be uh, considering. And there are a lot of pitfalls that you can run into with all of these things that so can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, and you know, there'll, there'll be some, some additional talks. I think Derek's talking uh, after lunch, um, talking about all this stuff. And one thing you'll hear from us a lot is that something will never be 100% accessible, but the, the more you do to improve accessibility and to take these considerations into account, the happier your, 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 ah, your users will be. Um, and you can remove you know, one barrier at a time 
to people by taking into consideration the different ways that they may interact with your site, the different uh, assistive technologies that they may use in order to be able to uh, access your content and, and um, accomplish their, their tasks. I'm gonna just kind of go do a couple quick hits here. Um, don't do things like relying, relying, uh, relying only on color. Think about how you can convey information in multiple ways, perhaps adding iconography to your color and such. Um, make sure that you have a good amount of contrast. Leia Veru put together a pretty awesome tool uh, that's linked there in the bottom. It's also in the, the show notes um, to ensure that your content is actually nicely readable. Um, Create connections between your content. If you reference a piece of content, a figure, a table, or something like that, anchor to it, right? Let somebody move directly to that thing. These anchor points are really useful also for people who wanna reference your content from other places on the web too, whether it's in a tweet or whether it's in a research document or something like that. Provide space around interactive elements. This has been you know, a recommendation for a while. Um, dating all the way back to like the, the human interface guidelines from Apple when the iPhone came out. Um, we need to think about people who have fat fingers like me, um, who aren't really accurate when we're touching screens and such. And then we need to consider what our designs leave unsaid. You know, when we have things that are just kind of generic, view more, read more, finish reading, these things are not terribly helpful. It's, it's better, I would say, even than this, if you can put in, in the actual content what's going on, um, but you can add in an ARIA label and say you can finish reading, the web should just work for everyone in less than 10 minutes, or something to that effect, so you're providing more context around where that link is pointing. All about enhancing that experience. So really quickly to, to uh, touch on some ways that we can do this in CSS, um, a lot of people don't think about how the structures of CSS enable us to do stuff like this, but we can have multiple colors. So for a browser that doesn't understand RGBA, so in a really old browser, um, they would get just green, but we can provide a little bit more subtle green for browsers that understand RGBA, just based on the, the order in which we put our declarations. Similarly, the selectors that we use will help us to, uh, to direct specific pieces of CSS to specific browsers. Um, so this selects H1s that have adjacent sibling paragraphs. Not every browser supports has. So browsers that don't won't get this rule at all. But browsers that do, um, actually, yeah, Chris Coyer uh, mentioned this uh, in, a, in a piece earlier. This trips up a lot of people. If you're using um, like Focus Within, which not all browsers support, if, if you have a compound selector like this, if any one piece of that compound selector isn't understood, the whole rule set gets thrown away. So just be aware of that. Sorry, I forgot I had that aside in there. Um, so yeah, browsers that don't support focus within will ignore this entire thing, even if they understand hover. Um, whereas if they do understand fo focus within, they'll apply all of it. So just be careful how you combine. Um, but browsers that do support has plus P um, would apply the green to the heading. All right, um, taking it up a level, we have uh, at media blocks, if a browser doesn't understand media queries, it would actually ignore at media only screen. And so you can actually hide content or, or hide CSS from older browsers. This is actually a really nice way to have advanced styles in one chunk and not even bother delivering that stuff uh, to older browsers that don't understand media queries like IE8 and below. Um, you can even deliver select style sheets based on uh, media queries. And then for something like at supports, there's actually a couple of different levels that you're looking at. First of all, if the browser doesn't support at supports, it's obviously gonna ignore the whole block just like it would do with media queries. Um, if it supports at supports, but it doesn't support display grid, it would ignore what's inside of that block. And then if it understands display grid and at supports, it will apply the green. So understanding these mechanics will help you uh, to actually be able to selectively deliver um, really cool uh, experiences for people using CSS. And all of this works because browsers ignore what they don't understand. And uh, new specs smartly override conflicting syntax. Now Jen mentioned this actually in her talk, uh, and this is what's, what makes Manuel's uh, example here work. If you apply Flexbox styles to something that is floated, those floats go away. 
If you apply grid styles to something that is display flexbox, the flexbox stuff goes away. So it creates this nice, uh, nice pattern of, of being able to kind of level up your styles. The only place you really end up needing to use something like at supports with display grid versus, let's say, flexbox is if you have to change the margins because you're using grid gap or something like that. So there, you shouldn't have to use at supports that often if you're building up layouts like this, which is kind of cool. Um, now, in terms of mobile-first design, uh, I'm going to use a really old uh, example here just to, to kind of illustrate um, why building from mobile-first makes the most sense, and, and Dave touched on this a bit yesterday as well. Um, but if we were to take a desktop or large screen approach first um, to a site and we were to shrink it down using media queries, we're going to end up writing the code for the desktop first, and then we're going to have media queries that basically have to undo those styles. So here you have these two, two elements that are floated next to each other, and then you're undoing that float within the media query for the smaller screen. Right? Um, whereas if we start mobile first, we can go with the default fact that those two things are going to block level on top of each other, and then only within the context of the media query where it's saying a minimum width of 600 pixels, then float the things next to one another. So you end up writing a lot less code when you start from mobile first because you're relying on those browser defaults. You're taking what you can get for free and then building up as you go. Um, you can also use this mobile first approach to selectively deliver advanced styles, to isolate large CSS images to only within your min width media queries so that Im images, background images are not being downloaded on smaller screens that aren't gonna make use of them. Whereas if you do it the other way, you're downloading all of the images and then throwing some of them away. Um, you don't also don't wanna hide content images using CSS, that's a really bad thing. That's kind of like an invisible tax on your users. They're paying to download those and don't get any benefit from them. Use responsive images, prefer system fonts if you can, use font display optional, which Dave mentioned yesterday as well. These are all good approaches for being mobile first, and they have huge benefits in the space of PWAs as well. Just adding a manifest and a service worker and caching a bunch of stuff is not gonna make your site super performant. It's not gonna make it a great experience. We have to start at the, the essence at the core. Um, so screen real estate's a capability just like any other. So we should be thinking about that as kind of a, a continuum um, as we're thinking about how we enhance the user experience for our, our users. All right, last little jog here before lunch. So um, the next thing we need to do is think about how we can improve that core experience with JavaScript. Now I'm not one of those people who believes that, that JavaScript is, should be the core experience. Um, so you remember I said that Browsers ignore what they don't understand when it comes to HTML and CSS. That cannot be the case with JavaScript, sadly. Okay. Um, now, the reason for that is that JavaScript is an application. It is a programming language. If part of the programming language is not understood by the interpreter, bad things happen. So I'm gonna give a really simple illustration here, the keyword let, which gives you a scoped variable. Right, so this, this variable i is scoped only to the for loop that's happening here. Um, super simple example, right? Now, in any modern browser, we get this nice experience um, where it would count up uh, one, two, three, four, success, right? Um, that's awesome, but in older browsers, nothing happens. None of that JavaScript runs, even the bits that it understands. Okay, not the code before it encounters the let, not the code after it encounters the let. Now, granted this is IE8, this is a really old browser, we shouldn't be really worrying about that, but let isn't actually supported by anything less than IE10. Um, it's not supported in Opera Mini, which is more than 5% globally. That's a pretty big deal. The Android and QQ browsers, which are also really big, um, Jen talked about that yesterday. These browsers don't support let, so if you're delivering JavaScript with let in it to every client, there are a lot of instances where your code is just not going to run. Just by having that instead of var, right? That's crazy. It's so hard to wrap your head around, right? Why does it have to be this way? It just, it is because JavaScript's a programming language. 
right? So this, this is why a lot of folks transpile stuff from being an ES6 back to older versions of JavaScript and why it's important to, to have a plan to selectively deliver um, JavaScript to older uh, browsers in a way that they can actually understand it or to have an experience that works without JavaScript because then you don't have to worry about those old browsers. Maybe you just don't deliver anything to them. You check to see if, if certain uh, JavaScript features are available and then deliver JavaScript only in that instance. And then you don't have to test there. And if you know your site works without JavaScript, great. Problem solved, I don't have to test it. Right? I don't even have to worry about these. I can just sidestep it. Um, so yeah, uh, more, de more dependencies, more potential problems. And this can happen with anything. And the reality is, is if your JavaScript is necessary to use your site and to accomplish key tasks, you're going to run into issues. And your analytics likely won't tell you about it because most of your analytics are run via what? JavaScript. <laughs> so if JavaScript's not executing, you're not getting any stats on it, unless you have a backup plan for that as well. Um, Dave mentioned you, know, you can probably remove jQuery uh, yesterday in his talk. Uh, GitHub actually has a huge post about that. And what I particularly liked about this post is that they, uh, they talked about what their, their focus was in, in their extraction of jQuery. And they actually focused on getting away from using JavaScript as much as possible to focus on HTML as a foundation as much as they could, and then only adding JavaScript behaviors as a progressive enhancement, so ensuring people, that people could do what they needed to do without JavaScript, even on something as big as GitHub. That's pretty cool. So we can and we should use JavaScript, but we need to do so thoughtfully and with intent. Right? We can't just do it haphazardly. Depending on how your project setup is, um, you could just enable server-side rendering and routes to handle links from incoming actions when JavaScript fails to load um, and have a really usable baseline, right? Um, and then you can download your JavaScript application, this thick client, and then have it take over the experience. Airbnb was probably one of the, the biggest first, or, or the first biggest examples of this. Um, or you can do it on the feature level. So um, in this an instance, I'm using uh, WebAuthn. So WebAuthn is a relatively new spec that aims to kind of bypass some of the security issues with passwords and actually allow you to log in with your device's biometrics. Okay, so in this, in this particular video that I'm showing, um, the, uh, the store has just recently implemented WebAuthn after I've already got an account there. So um, it's got a credit card on file. I go to purchase the product, checking out with that card, and then it prompts me for my password. I enter that and it says, hey, I recognize that you've got WebAuthn, and so hey, would you like to be able to log in with Windows Hello, for instance, or your fingerprint or what have you. Jason Grigsby has some, some talks about WebAuthn and, and using these approaches as well. And it's pretty cool to be able to use these newer APIs and technologies. Um, we should absolutely be doing that because things like this can help us uh, avoid things like data breaches and phishing attacks because we're relying on biometrics instead of passwords. And it's a web standard, so we can actually test, just like we did with the, the service worker, we can test to see whether navigator.credentials is supported. And then we can apply our WebAuthn code in order to bring this experience to reality. And so what you end up with in terms of this continuum of experience is you have your normal password field, but then if the browser supports WebAuthn, the user can choose to use that as a, a means of uh, logging into a site, which is pretty cool. And this is when we start to get into that PWA territory, right? We're creating more native-like experiences. Um, but you don't need to have a PWA specifically to add enhancements like this. Right? You can add this to any site. But I'm sure some of you are probably wondering, wait, this talks about progressive web apps, and progressive web apps require service worker, and service worker is JavaScript. Gotcha. Right? Um, yeah, service workers do require JavaScript, but service workers were designed as an enhancement to existing pages. So your site will continue to work just as well, well, not just as well, but it'll continue to work for users who don't have service worker support, but people who do have service worker support will get an enhanced experience that works better offline and provides a, a more network resilient um, experience, right? They're not a requirement to use the page. 
um, because as you recall, we test to see whether the service worker is supported first before we do anything else. Right? So you end up with a site that then becomes a progressive web app. Right? Um, or if you want to kind of get super granular, you could say you've got a site and then it's a PWA in the browser and hey, it can be installed to your desktop or to your mobile device. So again, layers of experience. You could even break it down even further just within thinking about service worker enhancements specifically. We've got our site. We have a site that has, net, uh, has uh, more network resilience. Sorry, that should be more network resilience. Uh, a site that works offline, a site that can do one-off syncs, a site that can do push notifications, and maybe even a site that can do periodic syncs. The, uh, the background sync or periodic sync spec is coming soon too, and that'll allow you to exchange information between the browser and uh, whatever your server-side code is without the user actually having to be on your website. More like an app you can kind of uh, get or send information back and forth a little bit more easily, which is kind of cool. And with time, we'll get more and more features along these lines. Um, a new one that just came in is being able to have your uh, website be a share target. Um, and so I actually implemented that on my own site for myself. So I've installed my PWA on my phone. Um, and then when I have a link that I find on Twitter that I want to share on my site, I can share it to my own site and it pops up a form and I can fill that in and then share it to my site, which is kind of cool, right? It's just, just for me, it's not for any of you, but that's kind of a, a nice little feature for myself and that's made possible by uh, the web app manifest and such. And we can and should be using JavaScript thoughtfully, right? This is totally something that we can do. Um, and we have to remember that you know, we can't always be certain that our JavaScript is going to reach our users. And we need to look for ways to think, or, or we need to really concentrate on thinking about our, our experiences as being a continuum and look for ways to enhance them based on the capabilities of our users, of their devices, the networks that they're on, and such, but without ever compromising that universally available baseline. Okay, as I mentioned, PWAs start with a great web experience and then enhance that experience for performance, resilience, installation, and engagement, right? It all starts with that great web experience. And we build that experience by focusing on what matters, by using markup to support that core experience, by using design to support that core experience, and by using JavaScript to support that core experience. All right, thank you all very much.